I'd like to uh, begin today with an ancient wisdom quote that comes from the Blackfoot people. And it, it goes, humans are but one instrument in the ongoing orchestra of life. Humans are but one instrument in the ongoing orchestra of life. Their job is to keep themselves in tune and to play accordingly with the rest of life. Their job is to keep themselves in tune and to play accordingly with the rest of life. And I'd like to just start with a, um, with a story. It's a story that, I, uh, that comes from my father. I grew up on a farm in the Midwest in Iowa that's been in the family since the 1870s. And the seventh generation is growing up on that land now. And when my nephew, his grandson, with whom he farms now was probably 10, 11 years old, I heard my father telling him, you know, if you get the better deal with a neighbor, but getting that better deal puts him out of business, you've both lost. You've both lost. Talk about context. Talk about interrelationship. Another, uh, another just snippet. I got an email from my my 40-year-old daughter last week saying, Mom, do you have, can you tell me, is there anything going on in the outer world that would make sense of what I'm feeling? I'm being overwhelmed by pain right now. And it, it's not my pain, it's the pain of the world. And I said, um, I said, well, yes, and I send her a bunch of things, and she said, I'd like to talk. And so last night we, last night we talked uh, briefly and she said what she's experiencing, you know, and this is a child who as a three-year-old, I gave her a marigold uh, plant that was her, her own. We lived in the country and she wanted to tend, so I gave her a marigold plant. And come fall, the marigold died, you know, as marigolds do. And she, she was unconsolable because this plant had died. And I looked at her and I thought, oh my God, you know, here's another one. Um, what a job I have as a parent to, to raise this one. How do, how do you raise someone who has this kind of sensitivity? And so what she said she's been experiencing is, is the pain of the world. And she's clear it's not her pain, that it's the pain of the world. And, and she's in it, she said, it's so overwhelming that I can't watch the news. Mm -hmm. I can listen. But if I watch it, I get a visual image, it's, it's too much. You know, it's like, what do I do? And she said, there's so much pain in the world, I feel so inadequate to do anything about it. It's like, what can I possibly do? You know, and this is a woman who's got her PhD in public policy or her master's in public policy from Harvard. You know, this is no slouch woman. Um, and so I reminded her of Gandhi's quote, you know, that said, there's very little that any one of us can do and it's really, really, really important that we do it. And so I, you know, so she told me about a woman that she's trying to help find a job rather than having to fire her. And I said, that's a perfect example, you know, of dealing with a pain that is in front of you. Do, you know, do that. Mm -hmm. And then just the last brief story, and then I'm gonna tell you what I think I'm gonna talk about this morning, but I'll find out as well as the words come out of my mouth. Um, <laughs> I was rereading David Peet's Blackfoot Physics, and if you've not read that book, uh, it's a marvelous, marvelous book. Blackfoot Physics, David Peet, P-E-A-T, a British physicist. And in it, he tells a story of a conversation that someone was having with an Algonquin woman. And the question that they asked was, um, was are, um, is that rock alive? And the Algonquin woman said, yes. And then she was quiet for a while, and she said, but not all rocks are alive. And he said, you know, just to keep it interesting, he said, well, how do you know which ones are alive? And she said, the ones that are breathing. <laughs> That's how you tell if they're alive. And then what they noticed was the, the rocks that for her were alive were the ones that were around where she lived, the ones with whom she had a relationship. 
Those were the rocks that breathed. Okay? All right, so what do I want to talk about this morning? I want to talk about context. I want to talk about um, oneness and duality and what's the task of, of humans uh, right now at, at, at this time. And there's been a whole lot of talks that talk about context, and thank you to all of you because you've all been speaking ab ab about, uh, about context. And what I want to do, though, is take us, take us back to a place and, and it's like in one sense, remind us of the world that we came into because it's so different than the world that we are going into and the actual world that exists. You know, we came into Newton's world. We came into the world where, where everything was a thing. It was object and it was separate. And that's how we were taught to perceive. That's how we were taught to believe. That's how our brains are wired. That's how the English language itself is, is constructed. It's a noun-based language. So what do you do if you have a language that's largely noun-based? Well, you separate. You see everything as a thing, as an object. So in the 19, late 60s, 70s, and 80s, I found myself through a series of synchronistic events at the University of California at Santa Cruz with one of the best jobs I've ever had in my whole life. The charge that I had was to bring academic wisdom and understanding to the, to the issues that seemed to be facing the world. And I was free to do it pretty much any way I wanted to as long as it met academic criteria, there was the, the public was interested in it, and it was self-supporting. Those were, those were the three criteria the three criteria. And that was the time, you know, it was the time we had gone through, a, you know, we had killed President Kennedy, it was Watts riots, it was women's lib, it was the beginning of the ecological, uh, the ecology movement, it was Martin Luther King, I have a dream, you know, it was women's lib, it was, you know, uh, free love, Woodstock, you know, and so trying to make sense of, of what was going on in that world at the time was the charge. And so, um, I was free to invite anybody in the world that I wanted to, and I did. So I brought together just amazing luminaries to, to look at this through as many interdisciplinary ways as possible. And to make a long story short, what we discovered, you know, what, what we came to, which was just this amazing <clears throat> light bulb for me, was that we've been living in a world that, had de that was Newton's reality that was a world that said everything is separate, and that was a lie. Not that it was a lie, it was, it's true at one level, but that there was a larger truth beyond that, and that truth was everything is interconnected. Everything is related. That the fundamental nature of reality, of life, is one of relationship. Not of things, but it's of relationship. And that thingness is really only created by a decision that we make at a, at a moment in time to fixate something. And the minute we take our fixation away from it, it starts to move and change and flow. And what, what I came to understand was that, and appreciate, was that um, when the hard sciences, you know, physics, I mean, you don't get much harder than physics. The hard sciences that everybody takes, oh yeah, they say it's got to be that way, you know, and now it's also evolutionary biology. But when the sciences and indigenous wisdom are saying the same thing, I'll bet my life that it's true. And, and what we discover is that they are saying the same thing about the fundamental nature of reality, that it is a place of oneness that we only exist through relationship, that what I do, I mean, it's, it's easy to imagine, I think, for each of us to imagine that what I do could somehow impact uh, what Bill experiences on the opposite side of the room. It's another step, though, to say that what, I, what I'm thinking and what my emotional state is creates your reality creates what you may be experiencing and either limits or some, somehow uh, describes, enables what is possible for you to do or to be. 
But that's that's exactly what that's exactly what is so. So the after leaving the university and then spending two years in organizational design with uh, with with Bill, I went on a ten year journey with. Um, a mixed blood Native American teachers, Firehawk and I did a formal apprenticeship with them. And the, the main reason that I did it was because I wanted to move beyond an intellectual understanding of oneness into an, experi un, into an experiential understanding of oneness. Because the thing about um, most indigenous languages and most indigenous peoples is that their lives, their languages are verb based. They're, they're, they're not noun based at all. They, they have sometimes thousands of conjugations for a verb, one, one verb. And it's all about flow. There is the lang theirs is the language of flow and movement and relationship. And so, so to me, that brings me to the to the place of duality. How much time do I have? Five minutes. Okay, great. Um, so here we have English, you know, which is which is really good in one sense for the external, you know, for what Bohm would call the explicate order, you know, for what we see, you know, indigenous languages, indigenous mindsets, indigenous models are are fabulous. For the implicate order, for what are typically invisible realms, and so it's not like, in one sense, that one is right or one is, and the other is wrong. They're they're both a gift. They're both different ends of a continuum, and we need them both. And that takes me to duality because underneath, you know, or, or on top of really, this underlying place of oneness is the duality that we experience. Earth is a plane of duality. That's just how it is, you know? We got black, white, rich, poor, male, female, hot, cold, winter, summer, you know? It, it's, a, it's a place of duality. Republican, Democrat, you know, talk about <laughs> duality. You know, and, and, and we, have, we have created our lives in this way that is really bizarre. You know, we fight about saying, well, it's this, you know, it's Republican is right, or Democrat is right, or masculine is better, or feminine is better. You know, and it's like, what a ridiculous discussion to have. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just crazy. You know, and if we think of duality and, as, uh, and difference as instead being the loom of reality, the loom upon which we weave our reality, and our job is to take difference, is to take duality, and to create a tapestry of amazing beauty. That's our job as humans. I mean, I just get goosebumps thinking about it, you know? Um, and as, as humans, the gift that we have at this time, as we are learning to see, because my work really now, and Firehawk's work and Lana's work, in a very real sense, it's about teaching people to see, to see into the invisible realms and to work. If you work, if you work at the realm of energy before something comes into form, it's much easier to make the shift. Once something is in form, it's concretized and it's harder to move around. Energy's easier to move around. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, that's the work that Mm -hmm. um, that's the work that, that I'm involved in. And, and I think this evolutionary leap that we're in, in um, on the planet at this time really is about learning to see. It's about learning to perceive differently because once we, once we feel the marigold, once we feel the pain, once we see the exquisite beauty that exists, we behave differently. We, we can't, you know, it's like there's a saying that goes, um, you can't ever hate somebody whose story you really know. Once, once we know, once we really know the life, whether it's a human or the more than human life, we tend to fall in love with them because of, because of their beauty. 
So, you know, so for, for me right now, it's time for humans to grow up. It's time for us to, one minute, okay. It's time for us, I think, to, to learn discipline, but not discipline in that old, harsh, you know, yardstick, you know, that, that kind of way, a discipline that imprisons, but instead a discipline that frees. You know, it, I started with that quote of humans being one instrument in an ongoing orchestra of life and our responsibility is to keep ourselves in tune and to play accordingly with the rest of life. Because in order to do that, we have to know who we are. You know, and we have to know what does it take to keep me in tune? We have to respect ourselves in, as an instrument of co-creation and then behave accordingly. And then once we are walking around in our wholeness and balance, then we are free to create in a marvelous, magical way with the rest of life. So the question that I'd like to offer to, into the circle this morning mm -hmm. is if you see yourself as an instrument in the ongoing orchestra of life, what does it take for you personally to stay in tune? What do you need? What fosters staying in tune. That's the, that's the first part of it. And then the second part is, of it is, is who do you love to play with in this orchestra? And if you're not playing with who you, who you love to play with now, who would, who would you love to be playing with? So that's the question.